Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. It's intermission at the International Climate Talks. It's the Pacific Perspective Protect Our Planet. And we're so fortunate to be with one of the exciting leaders sharing her experience being here on the ground in Glasgow and see what's going on from an island perspective. Sheila, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I am so, I'm so honored to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. No, yesterday was quite a historical day at COP. Can you share your day with us a little bit? Yes, it was very exciting. Um, my goodness, where do I start? I got to introduce President Barack Obama on this international stage, and it was quite the experience as an Obama leader as a fellow Pacific Islander, um, you know, I was offered this opportunity and, and I took it. So it was a wonderful way, a very humbling way to share the stories of the people of the Mariana Islands, um, indigenous communities all over the world. And, you know, to have that opportunity to do it on this international stage, was something that's much needed at this time because we Pacific Islanders have been dealing with climate change for decades. It's been here, right? It's not going to come, it's not going to happen. It's been here and it's here today. So, you know, being able to get on that stage and share our experiences, our stories, um, that's part of the reason why I came all the way here to Scotland. Can you share a bit about some of the Pacific voices and some of the concerns that have been raised throughout the region? And then we can get specific on some of the most important imminent issues in the Northern Mariana Islands as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think across the Pacific, we can relate and struggle when it comes to colonialism, climate change and militarization and you know, this dates back centuries. So, you know, learning about militarization in the Pacific was something that I learned about at the age of 30. It was during my first term in office. I am the youngest elected official in the Mariana Islands. I am the chairwoman of the Natural Resources Committee. And I also chair the Friends of the Mariana's Trench. It was during my first term that I attended a public meeting and learned about the militarization that was happening in the Mariana Islands, the milita military plans that were proposed. And it really opened the doorway for me to learn about militarization all over the Pacific. And this is deeply connected to climate change because we in the islands, we see our shorelines disappearing before our very eyes. And I'm sure in other islands, you know, just like we're experiencing in the, in the Marianas, our typhoons have become unpredictable. It is no longer, there is no longer a typhoon season. It comes when it comes. And, you know, that's something that we have to just be prepared for. And they now turn into super typhoons. So, so we have been dealing with climate change for decades and militarization, you know, there's that intersection because the, the US military is the largest polluter, the largest consumer of fossil fuels. And that's why we need to talk about it. And talking about militarization, climate change, colonialism, these are really big concepts. And, you know, we have to chip at it day by day, right? One conversation at a time. Um, it is a very sensitive issue to talk about in my community when it comes to militarization, because we do have a long history of the military being in our islands. And we do have the highest per capita of enlisted servicemen and women. I have family members, I have friends who serve today in the US military. But I also have noticed that it's not just in my community that it is such a sensitive, hard topic to discuss. It's also on this global stage because it's not even on the agenda. 
We are not talking about militarization at all at COP26. Why is that? Why isn't it on the agenda? As an elected official, the agenda is what guides the discussion. We cannot even allow members of the community to make a comment during our house sessions if it's not on the agenda, right? So that means we're not going to address it. So, you know, that's one thing that I asked President Obama and the other leaders when we had a round table later on in the day yesterday, after I introduced him, you know, they heard me off through the back room, right? And I got to ride with his people down to the second location where we had um, a round table with other fellow Obama leaders from um, Obama Leaders Africa and Europe. There were Obama scholars in the room, and which is a different program. Uh, students from Columbia University because it was a co-hosted event. And when it came my turn to ask a question, I asked about that because it's a very hard topic to talk about, um, but we have to bring it into these spaces where we have global leaders at the table because it's the only place that it can start to be addressed. But, you know, I was really concerned about that. And I also wondered if there were spaces, other spaces that we need to be aware of where these conversations are taking place because I'd like to know where that is so I can attend. <laughs> yes, I mean, that's, that's another conversation we definitely will have. I mean, we're here at the Super Bowl of sustainability. And, it, and it's great to hear what you're doing here and also behind the scenes, right? Because everybody just saw the headlines yesterday, but I think you really brought up a salient point. You have to connect decarbonization and decolonization because it's the same challenge that indigenous peoples have faced for centuries. So you brought it up really well. And then if you link it also with your sister and other colleagues, just a little bit over in Micronesia, looking at Marshall Islands, it's not the right. first time that the Pacific was asked to sacrifice for the global greater good. It was in the name of security right. that over 66 nuclear tests were detonated. And now it's the way of life of shopping and Hummers and you know consumption society. And once again, the people of the Pacific are put on the altar of sacrifice. And what really matters most though is, is the preciousness of life. And I think those are one of the the points that you brought yes. up as well. Yes, and you know, that's one thing that we also try to educate our community on is that link between the health of our community and militarization. Because when bases open in a community, it studies show that it negatively impacts the health of a community. Not just, you know, um, it doesn't just bring in jobs and, jobs and you know other industries that also seem it, it doesn't seem to extend out into the community right and so um so it's really important to make that link so that our community is aware that um there are social impacts there are health impacts and where i come from in the mariana islands there is major distrust when it comes to you know, talking to the US military, we have played a huge role during World War II. And to this day, we have unexploded ordinances littered throughout the land. We have tanks and planes and, you know, the military hasn't cleaned up their mess. So when they come in with new plans and proposed activities saying that they're stewards of the ocean, um, it's just something that we don't take very lightly, right? And we, we expect more community engagement. And so that's where our Commonwealth 670 really has, it's a grassroots organization. I am a board member. Uh, we started this organization at a women's summit when militarization was on the agenda. You know, the women in the Mariana Islands have led the the fight, they've led the discussion about militarization because they are caring for their families, for their children, for the health of the land and the ocean. And, um, and so at the summit, we, we got together a group of passionate 
intelligent women who have also been studying militarization and who have been a part of this discussion, this fight for decades. It's very heavy work, you know, it's very emotional. Um, it is challenging. And, and so we also need new blood, right? We need to get the youth involved. We just need to make sure that everybody knows what's going on because I don't want um, my nieces, my nephews, my children to learn about this at the age of 30. This is something that we need to be aware of from adolescence and above, right? Yeah, and I think Obama's message really, half of it was sort of telling the world where we are and where we're going. And he called out China for not being there. But the second half was really dedicated to the youth. Could you maybe share how that message resonated with you and what it was oh, like? And if you think that inspired the youth around the world to even be more active and involved going forward for this final week of COP negotiations? Oh, yes, for sure. So I'm here at COP26 as a part of a huge delegation called It Takes Roots Delegation. And it's an umbrella alliance of other alliances of indigenous communities throughout the world. And, you know, this is just one of the other many hats that I wear, but they did bring this opportunity um, to me and I accepted graciously. And so that's how I'm here in Scotland. And so with this delegation, I am surrounded by youth. Um, you know, being a young legislator, I also spend a lot of time with the youth. I enjoy, I enjoy my time in the classrooms. It's one of my favorite places to be. And it is, it was there. It was in the classroom where the kids brought up climate change to me. So I'm here because of them. I would really like to thank the youth of the Marianas for bringing it to my attention. You know, it was something that they would always ask me about. They would push, uh, they would they would invite me to come and listen to their presentations um, about climate change. And so, and so it's important to the youth of my community, and I'm sure many communities all over the world. And that's the energy that we need. That's the leadership that we need to respect because we really need to view it as the renewable resource that it is. Now, that's a great point. And Maybe could you share with people back home, right? Because it's hard to imagine, like, what happens at a cop? Can you share a little bit about your day and what, you, what you've done so far, but what's coming up this week as we head into the final uh, days of negotiation? Yes, yeah, so I, it's been a whirlwind. There's so many things going on, so many workshops and meetings. I have been um, invited to sit on a number of panels where we aim to spread awareness and educate the community around us here, the other leaders around us. Um, I've also been a part of demonstrations and um, protests taking place inside and outside the event. And this is something that we spoke about in, uh, in the round table with President Obama is the power of, of the people when they come together and put pressure on leaders to hold leaders accountable, to take action, right? To offer real solutions and not false solutions. And so um, I, haven't, I haven't been in the spaces where the actual negotiations are taking place yet. That's to come this week where I hope to um, enter the meeting rooms or spend more time inside. But um, I do have a couple of more panels this week. We do have um, a couple of more actions that are taking place. So it's, it's a lot, you know, happening up here, but it's really exciting. It's a, it's a new space for me to be in, but it's also familiar because it is like politics, but at the global level, right? Yes. So one thing that I do want to point out, though, is that it's political, right? I mean, that's something that President Obama did mention in his speech as well. It's politics. So, you know, let's not ignore that. And so that's why I'm in politics, right? Um, that's how you get the uh, you get to the decision making table. You have to you have to learn the ropes, you have to learn the ways of this arena. And, um, and so one thing I wanted to note was that the, the lobbyists, the fossil fuel delegation is the biggest. 
here at COP26. That's something that I'm learning from this delegation that I'm a part of, right? Um, so there are more members in COP26 right now related to the fossil fuel industry than there are actual leaders of countries. So, you know, thinking of that, it just really breaks my heart because coming all the way from the Pacific Islands, I flew over the Pacific Ocean, over the United States continent, and over the Atlantic Ocean to be here, you know? Like, I flew a far, a far, far away, and it was not an easy journey. I mean, with COVID-19 adding extra layers of, of this journey, just it made me realize why um, accessibility, you know, accessibility matters. And it made me really think about all the leaders in the Pacific Islands who are not here. And, you know, I, I understand that the president of, you know, China is not here, chose not to be here, but how about the rest of the leaders around the world who did want to be here? You know, yes. um, I think that really will force us to reimagine how we gather and how we make decisions. No, and it's, it is this 26 conference of parties. And as Obama pointed out, it is political. And I think one thing he did do is sort of the, maybe that same message he said for you, right? I remember in your story, you shared when Obama, you asked Obama a question, he said, raise awareness, rally allies, and then maybe unify Oceania. And that's really what we have to do. And that's where really the high ambition coalition, as well as the small island states, or as we know, large ocean nations have come together to say, really it's 1.5 to stay alive. And if we don't concentrate and make sure that we reach 1.5 in the negotiations, and continue to ratchet up at every COP, the nationally determined contributions are so important. And I think what you brought up was excellent, that it's a community level that you're organizing in the classroom, around the community, but then at the Capitol where you're involved as a, as a representative, and then now you're at the global civil society where everyone's here from around the world. And as you pointed out, it's a great point. The article just broke that fossil fuel companies have more representatives than Pacific Island heads of states, that they're there in the halls all the time negotiating. So you might think that the world knows what's wrong and what's right, but the International Chamber of Commerce, all those entities are there to still pursue profit. And that's where the people power is coming in to challenge the profits. But more importantly, I would say, and you see this as well from the Pacific, is we're really speaking for the planet though. And it's in that spirit of Malama Honua, where Hokule has gone around the world that's taking care of each other and our Mother Earth. And maybe you can share a little bit about some of the other meetings you've had bringing those points out. Oh, yes, for sure. You know, um, like I mentioned during the introduction for Obama, uh, Indigenous communities, we hold the keys to solve the climate issue. We have a deep connection to the lands and the oceans. We've been the first stewards to take care of Mother Earth. And colonialism has really just done so much damage. So if we can find, if we can find a way to include indigenous communities in these spaces and seriously consider the solutions that you know they offer we can really turn things around because we have to put the land, the water, the air first. That's what climate change is about. It's really about taking care of our environment. Mm, you know, um, that's how connected we are. If our lands, if our oceans, you know, if our air is polluted, if if the land is sick, we will be sick. And so we cannot he begin to heal ourselves if we don't heal our land, if we don't heal Mother Earth. And that's why demilitarization is such an important topic to talk about. Um, because studies show, you know, a number was shared with me today on a panel that I, I did with other members, other leaders in communities all over the world, Pakistan, New Mexico, 
you know, veterans of the Iraqi war, we were on this dem demilitarization panel and um, a statistic was shared that, that one fighter jet can fly for one hour and that would equate you driving your car for seven years. So if you were to give up cars and you'd ride your bicycle, you know, how is that going to compare to a fighter jet, just one flying for an entire day, right? We really need to address the really big elephant in the room uh, and that is the US military. And we, we really must try to imagine a, a place where we can take this funding and redirect it to take care of Mother Earth, right? So that we can, we can really begin to heal. We can utilize our resources in a more sustainable way because war is not sustainable. It really is for the profit. It's not for the environment. And that really comes up to the point of where we're at. When you look at the two points, one is to 1.5 to stay alive, but the other is the flow of financing and coming up with the alternatives of renewable energy, regenerative agriculture, as well as economy and the circular economy is being brought up a lot. Are there other ideas that you see that you might be able to take back to the Marianas? I mean, that's one of the best parts about coming to yeah. a COP is you get to learn a lot. You get to exchange and network. But then the other idea is you get the ideas that then can become initiatives that then can even improve the institutions that you're representing here, even though you're wearing multiple hats. Did you get some exciting ideas of what people shared that might be able to be brought home? Yes, for sure. Well, I'd, I'd like to share two. One of them is around the word action. And um, through this delegation, I've really been learning different ways that you know communities can organize and implement this, this action um, to put pressure on the leaders in your community. It's a really um, difficult thing to do where I come from because we do come from a very small community. So we do not organize. There's no activism really that's very disruptive, but you know, I'm learning ways we can disrupt the system without being so aggressive. It's, but still coming, um, still coming off as um, effective and influencing the decision makers at the table. The other is proper planning when, um, when dealing with militarization or demilitarization. I have met with uh, leaders from Puerto Rico who have successfully, um, you know, they have successfully pushed out the military in uh, Vieques and and you know, I, I want, we are going to sit on a panel together too, but those are the kinds of resources that I am looking to gather in addition to, you know, other types of ways to raise awareness and gather allies. It's really about bringing home resources, right? At the end of the day, I travel all this way so that I can raise awareness, so that I can gather allies, so that we can learn from one, one another and I can bring home resources, whatever that may look like, whether it's in knowledge, connection, right, future events. I mean, other ways that I can support indigenous communities around the world, but we really need to stand in solidarity. And that's key. Yeah, and we we're at an event last night where Palau will be hosting an oceans conference in February. So it's great that once again, the globe will be focusing on Micronesia. Maybe you could share with us a bit about the Marianas Trench and also the spiritual and cultural side of why it's so important to protect and have that nature-based solution and also place-based activism that you're involved in. Yeah, so the Marianas Trench uh, National Monument, the draft management plan was just released this year. We've been waiting for my goodness, almost 15 years for this draft management plan to come. So, you know, those are also things that we need to be aware of is that we can um, designate monuments and marine protected areas. But when there's a disconnection between uh, the local government and the federal government, then there's really no action taking place. So before the management plan was released, there really was no protection happening. So. We're very happy that the plan has been released. We have collected comments on that. 
um, there are three parts to this really big monument that will protect a huge part of the Marianas. And um, that's really important because, because there are many threats around us. There are many, many threats around us. And, you know, our ocean is a huge place and, um, and we need more support. We need more resources even to patrol the Pacific Ocean. It's huge. The Pacific Ocean is the blue continent. And um, our indigenous people, we not only view our home as the land that we are standing on, but it encompasses everything around us, like the air and the water. And we consider all of that our homeland. So, um, so having the Marianas Trench National Monument will really support the 30 by 30 goal. I think we're well ahead of that in Micronesia, um, we do set the example for marine protected areas um, because it's very important to us. It's our, it's our livelihood, it's our connection, and you know, it's our future. It is also, I believe, one of the deepest points. Maybe you could share a little bit more about just the sheer phenomenon of such a special, beautiful place you represent. Oh my goodness. Yes, the, the actual, so the Marianas Trench is the deepest, darkest place, the deepest, darkest point in the world, in our ocean. Um, it is largely undiscovered. Just this past year, a couple of voyages have been taking place down into the Marianas Trench, but, you know, it really is, it really is our mission as the friends of the Marianas Trench to connect our local community, the people who are on the ground, to, to this monument. Because I grew up learning nothing about the Marinus Trench. You know, that's unacceptable. That is completely unacceptable because then our people will not recognize the beauty that we're surrounded with, the blessings that, of a responsibility that we have to protect our land, our home. And so we aim to educate our, our youth. We work a lot with the youth. Um, and we also incorporate traditional knowledge with science and, um, and implement programs that way because we want to be a part of it. We want to be a part of exploring the Marinus Trench. And you know, if we can have commitments to funding to research, data collection, storage, and management, then we can increase the number of scientists that we have. We need more marine biologists. We need more scientists. We need labs. You know, if we can invest in science instead of war, then I think that would really lead us in a more prosperous direction. Excellent. It's definitely more of a long-term, sustainable centered around people, and more importantly, protecting our planet. And so right. it's been quite a week. It's only day two, though, of, of week two. So we still have a good three days, and many people believe it will go into the weekend on Friday night and Saturday all-night meetings. And as you said, there's still not enough on the agenda. But we can see at COP26 here at Glasgow, people are connecting all of the dots and really trying to see a new vision for where we need to go as a global community that really begins to understand that unique relationship and the fragility of the beautiful place that we call home. And you can see that happening. And I do appreciate you raising the decarbonization, the demilitarization and decolonization all together. And it's important, of course, in our next couple of days, as you get into the negotiating rooms, looking at loss and damages, looking at Article 6, it's really important to get our language around human rights into that final text. And of course, to make sure that the nationally determined contributions for Northern Marianas, for Hawaii, for all the United States, for everywhere, either doing nationally determined contributions or bringing it down and looking at voluntary local reviews under the sustainable development goals or locally determined contributions. It'll be great to partner with you going forward as we make sure Oceania is sustainable and that we partner together in solidarity for all the people of the Pacific. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing some of your experience and 
What a way to begin your moment on the global stage, introducing Obama. Really, he was sort of like the coach, trying to get the team motivated for the last week to make sure that the Paris Agreement isn't just a promise, but is actually policy that makes a difference to protect our planet. Thank you again, Maluhia, Mekapono, and thank you for making time. Thank you for having me. Aloha.